has been to try and regulate crypto assets and we've had the International Monetary Fund playing a very important role in putting together an architecture uh, which could help regulating uh, crypto assets in the global economy. To talk about this, we're joined here at the La Meridian Hotel in the National Capital by the first Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Geeta Gopinath. Thank you so much for joining us Hi and welcome. So could you start by explaining uh, the mechanism that you're hoping to bring together? You know, you've advanced the timelines, brought out a paper which looks at regulating crypto assets. So many people who trade uh, or were trading in crypto assets, very curious to know how exactly will this function? Yeah, this is one of the big achievements of India's G20 presidency, which is to bring together, when it comes to crypto assets, not just the regulatory aspect, but also the macro financial consequences. So for the first time, they brought together the Financial Stability Board, who does regulation, and the IMF, who does macro financial stability, and said, come together from that holistic perspective, what kind of policy actions are needed. So for instance, when it comes to monetary issues, you know, one of the clear statements is do not legalize the use of any crypto asset like Bitcoin for legal currency, because that would affect monetary sovereignty. When it comes to financial stability, the guideline is to make sure that you have such issuers of such crypto assets, that they are licensed, that they're registered, and you have the principle that if it's the same activity, same risk, then you have the same action in terms of the way you treat it. So it's laid out a, a very good set of broad principles. The work is not over because there's a roadmap in terms of what else needs to be done going forward. But this is the first time the global community has come together and agreed on a common set of principles. So the good thing is there's no talk of banning crypto. I mean, the idea that crypto is tough to ban has kind of gone through. But what, what concerns me is that different countries have adopted different positions on the spectrum of policy making and dealing with crypto assets. Do you think this provides a common framework? I ask because the G20 regulations or whatever comes out of the G20 isn't necessarily binding. That's certainly right. And there cannot be one size fits all, just given the complexity of the world and different levels of financial development the kinds of supervision and regulation they can have and so on. So there is going to be some tailoring to country specific circumstances. But everybody agreed that these broad principles were all on board with. Okay, do you want to give those watching a broad sense of what to expect once these principles are indeed accepted and the kind of timelines that you're looking at at this moment uh, for these principles to be brought into policy? I think it's going to be much less of the Wild West that we've had for a long time by throwing light on the different uh, issuers of these kinds of crypto assets, we're going to have much better data of what they're doing, what the extent to which they're penetrating into different, uh, you know, different people's pockets. There is going to be, if, it, if it's clear that you are effectively a speculative investment class, then you're going to be regulated in one way. If you're being used for payments, then you're going to be regulated as other payment systems are regulated. It's going to take some time to build up the specific details of it, but uh, much more transparency, much more you know, light being shed on it, and not the anything goes kind of environment. Let's spend a moment on your reading of the Indian economy at the moment, uh, seen as one of the key growth engines of the global economy. Uh, India projected to grow at 6.1% 2023, 6.3% next year uh, but concerns also being asked about raised about uh, private investment and private investment not kick starting in quite the way the government would have liked so do you want to share your reading of how you think the economy is doing at this moment now, India is uh, and continues to be an engine of global growth so we have uh, for this fiscal year we expect growth to be over six percent and two factors that are driving it are public investment which has been quite strong, and resilient consumption spending. So I think those are the two important factors. I mean, our estimate is that for this year, for 2023, India's growth would explain about 15% of global growth, right? So that is a substantial chunk of global growth that's being driven by uh, India at this point. But to get to much higher levels of per capita income and to get to continued high levels of growth, you need structural reforms, and that's going to be 
very important and there are multiple fronts on which these reforms will be needed. Those will be needed also to attract private investment. You know, a lot has been put in place in terms of improving the ease of doing business, but there is still a lot more that Do you needs to be done. you want to spend a moment talking about that because this government heads into an election and of course all of what you're saying is not linked to elections, but of all the structural reforms that you'd like the government to push through, uh, what is it that you think could have the biggest multiplier and the fastest improvement in the level of private investment? So creating an enabling environment for private investment, clearly very important. On that front, continuing the investment in public infrastructure, hugely important. Digital public infrastructure is playing a very important role. But in addition to that, you know, some of the harder decisions when it comes, for instance, to labor markets is needed. Now, that's not something that the center can do because you put, uh, I mean, there's a clearly reforms have been announced for labor market reforms, but many states have not implemented them yet. So that's going to be required. So if you actually see in terms of where foreign direct investment goes in India, there are about four states. There's Maharashtra, Karnataka, Gujarat, Delhi, that get a lot of, a big chunk of the investment and it's not going to other parts. So a lot has to be done at the level of state governments. Secondly, of course, uh, again, what I said about the ease of doing business, that it's still the case that there, are, there is a fair amount of red tape in opening uh, businesses in India. That's going to take uh, some work. Education, in terms of improving the quality of education, making it, you know, there are some fantastic institutions over here, but the depth of it uh, needs to be improved. More work on that front. Female labor force participation is way lower than what it should be at this level of, uh, of development in India. It's very low. Mm -hmm. That Raising that up would make a big difference. So these are some of the reforms that would be helpful. You may have seen uh, some commentary recently about concerns being raised internationally about whether the government is overstating economic growth. Came out 7.8% uh, was the estimate that was uh, put out recently. Is that a concern that you have? Because that's been a big concern somewhere else and now there's this controversy. So I'm kind of wondering what's your reading of it? No, this is not something that we, uh, we are concerned about. Um, you know, we look at a bunch of data, we look at lots of high frequency data and so on and, uh, you know, these are the numbers that we take. Let's spend a moment on digital public infrastructure, which has been one of India's uh, big ideas during this G20 presidency. And you travel internationally, you're seeing what's happening in global economies. Do you really think India's tech stack is of as much utility internationally as the government hopes it can be? I think India is really on the forefront in this area. Uh, it is, I mean, it's already seen the benefits for India itself. I mean, not just in terms of innovation and what is brought in, but also on the fiscal front in terms of much more, much more efficient spending, the ability to collect revenues, formalizing the economy. All of that has been phenomenal. I mean, that India is really a leader in that front. And other countries in the world are paying attention to what India is doing in this space. Do you see other countries wanting to adopt these technologies? Do you see this as being a part of what India can export in terms of ideas and tech globally? I think it already is doing that actually. It is absolutely exporting those ideas. There is now a push to make sure that we have platforms that are interoperable, uh, that you know, speak across borders, because clearly you know, there are different forms. This picks in Brazil, which has the features of India's UPI, but at the same time is different in other respects. And the question is whether you can have a much more integrated uh, platform. There's work being done on that front. But, you know, organically, a lot of these exchange of ideas is happening. Let's spend a moment on your reading of the Chinese economy at the moment, which is one of the big concern areas. Uh, the obituary of growth in China has been written often and has always proven wrong. But there are also concerns that maybe this time the distress is deeper and more real than it has been in the past. How do you read all the data that's coming or not coming out of China? Now, after a first uh, quarter that was very strong because of the rebound from the reopening, China's economy has slowed. And we see that in private consumption. The real estate sector, of course, is has had a lot of trouble for a long time. Uh, and we saw some improvement in the first few months of this year. But then again, we're seeing a deterioration. So that is an area of important concern. So, private in so investment is just down. 
confidence is down, consumer confidence and just broadly private sector confidence is down. Now, the good news is that China has the resources to be able to turn things around. It still can do much more in terms of fiscal policy and in terms of monetary policy, and they are taking actions in that dimension. But, you know, these are things that not, can't necessarily be turned around overnight. I mean, we expect China's growth to slow. Um, you know, for this year, for instance, we still think that it can meet the target that the government has set of about 5%. But then into the medium term, we have China's growth projected at around 3.4 percent, you know, uh, going down. So that's where we are. It's not like we're expecting to see a very deep downturn or a sharp recession or anything of that kind, but just slowing growth. So slowing growth at this level of economic evolution is understandable. But there are people who take it one step further and say, because, for example, youth unemployment, June was 21 percent before they shut off uh, unemployment data, they say the distress is much deeper and darker than the mandarins in Beijing would have us believe. Well, it's more than just saying that it, China's reached the size of an economy where the growth slows down, right? It's certainly more than that because we have revised down our projections for China relative to the pre-pandemic given the developments we've seen in the property And in your sector. revised projections, is there a point where China still overtakes the U.S.? Because that's become a matter of uh, global commentary about whether China ever does overtake the U.S. in terms of the size of the economy. Yeah, I mean, obviously, given the downgrade, it's going to take longer. Whether it will or will not will depend upon what kinds of policies the government does uh, take at this point. Like I said, it has the space to be able to make, uh, make changes to its uh, economic path. But... The combination of what we're seeing in terms of the property sector, the, the slowing confidence, the fact that the global demand, especially for manufactured goods, has come down quite a bit. I mean, all of this uh, are headwinds for China. We saw the U.S. Uh, Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, when she was in Beijing yes, uh, recently, speak about China becoming increasingly uninvestable, that ad hoc economic decision making is making it very complicated for American companies, international companies to invest in China. Do you see this uh, pulling away of this, uh, you know, not necessarily decoupling, but reducing interdependence being now cast in stone? Or do you think there, there is likely to be an economic rapprochement uh, more than we've seen so far? No, oh, I do think that we are in a time of uh, geoeconomic fragmentation. We're certainly seeing these geopolitical tensions are showing up in countries you know, moving away from each other. For instance, uh, Rahul, if you look at the uh, import restrictions that have been put, last year 3,000 new import restrictions were put. That was three times the number that was put in 2019. And if you look at where FDI is going, it's much more driven by now geopolitical considerations as opposed to geographic distance, which used to be a bigger role. So we are certainly seeing countries uh, distancing themselves in terms of the amount of integration, the, relative to how much of integration they had in the past. You know, the whole language of we're trying to de-risk and not decouple, I think is fine. It's much more harder to do in practice uh, and not go down a slippery slope. So this is a challenge for the world. And we've been at the IMF, I mean, this is one of our jobs, is to flag the risks to the, to the world from this. What are the risks at this moment? Because from India's perspective, it could possibly be a huge opportunity. To what extent have you been able to capitalize on the opportunity of the government through its uh, production-linked incentives, through its Make in India scheme, Atmanirbhar India, trying to pull away from China as part of anybody who's looking to reorient their supply chains uh, in keeping with China plus one. To what extent is India benefiting? That's from an Indian point of view. And what are the risks that you're observing from a more macro level? Yeah. No, in terms of the... You know, as the, in terms of the signaling, in terms of intent, when you talk to people and when you look at projects being announced, there is certainly a big interest in India right now, especially to, you know, to, in terms of the new policy of diversifying away from, you know, for instance, from China. But if you look at the last two decades of, uh, of manufacturing in India, the share of manufacturing GDP hasn't changed much. It's been around 17 to 18 percent over the last couple of decades, right? So, you know, clearly a greater push is needed in terms of uh, attracting all that investment in and in terms of making sure that uh, manufacturing has a higher share in production and making India is a, is a bigger success. You know, more, more will be needed. 
you spoke of risks because the IMF's task you said is also to highlight risks as this uh, uh, untangling happens. What are the risks that concern you the most? One is on inflation in the major economies. The good news is that it has been coming down. There have been hopeful signs, but we're not there yet. And we could still have a situation where inflation, yes, has come down, but doesn't go close enough to the targets of central banks, in which case they will need to raise interest rates by a lot more. And then we all might like to have the kind of soft landing that everybody's projecting at that time, and that could be a real shock to the global economy. Second is the war is not over. Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues. You could see big impacts on energy prices again, on food prices. That remains an important risk. China is a, is a concern. I think the downside risks to China's growth are, uh, have gone up. And we're seeing a lot of climate-related events, weather events around the world that's disrupting growth and affecting prices. Okay, so let's take it one by one because one of the things that was discussed in India's G20 is not linked directly to the G20 but President Biden, uh, MBS from Saudi Arabia uh, spoke of an India Mid East Europe corridor and the IMF is one of the bodies that will be involved in arranging financing for that. How do you see this infrastructure corridor play out? Yeah. So firstly we don't get involved, the IMF doesn't get involved in infrastructure projects. I just projects. saw Emmanuel Macron's uh, uh, press conference where he was speaking about working with the IMF and the World Bank in the project, yeah. Yeah, so on project financing it's squarely the World Bank. Of course we uh, get involved whenever there is a macro issue to deal with. Uh, this is a fresh announcement. There is, I know that there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for it, but I think it's too early to comment on the details of it. Okay. The other thing that's raising a lot of headlines is the idea that India will soon be the world's third largest economy. How soon do you see that happen? Uh, that it will happen sometime in the next few years seems inevitable. Uh, 2027 is one estimate, which, which is the SPI's estimate, seems the most aggressive estimate. Others say it could happen 2028, 29. What's your reading at this moment? Yeah, I think what you said that, yes, in a few years, not too long, in a few years, in the ballpark of the years you're talking about, based on current projections. What are your current projections for that? That would be, so if you looked at our, the last estimates we put out in July for India's growth, then you'd get around there to 2027, 20, 28. I think that's when you'd get to the third largest. But I think, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And the more important thing is to maintain a high growth momentum for many more years than just the next four or five years. And that's So you think it could happen reforms. by 2027? Based on, uh, in terms of the dollar, yes, in current value, in current dollar terms, you could, based on projections, it could get there by 27, 28. I think that's but based on that But you're also saying fiscal. that to keep the growth momentum going, you'd yes. like to see a lot more. Yes, what I mean, more? again, it's, you know, India is a large country. So in per capita terms, that will still be a small number, even if you're overall the third largest economy. So India needs to keep pushing on that front to keep the growth momentum going much more. We interviewed someone you know well, Borge Brande, the president of the World Economic F uh, Forum, and uh, at the India 800 Summit, he spoke of the next 10 years, seeing the Indian economy hit uh, the, uh, a $10 trillion value, and he said that the global economic order would be defined by what he called the G3, uh, the US, China, and India. I'm kind of wondering what you think of that. Okay, firstly, I'm not a huge fan of these projections of $10 trillion and so on. Uh, as we know, over the last three years, a lot can happen. We had the pandemic, we had the war, sure. things can get derailed, a lot of things can go wrong. You know, so setting aside those you know, big headline numbers, I think the important thing is that China, sorry, India is a very important player on the global stage. Clearly through the G20, it signaled a serious leadership role, even in terms of the the world growth, like I said, it's contributing like 15% of to world GDP growth. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. It has a, a young demographic population, which is again a big asset, but you need to be able to catalyze that through structural reforms. And how has this G20 been for you? Because on the finance track, there's been so much that's been happening. You spoke of uh, you know, India signaling global leadership. So what are the signals that you've been picking up and how's this year been for you? Well, I think it's been a great year for India's G20 presidency. 
you know, nobody expected that there would be a leader's declaration. The fact that there was one, um, I think, is a huge is a huge deal. It tells you that even though we can all be, you know, countries can have different opinions about the way the world is headed, they can actually come together and have a declaration. That's that I think is huge. The second thing I think they did really well was to, you know, bring put put a lot of light on the issues that emerging and developing countries care for. So bringing the African Union in as a member of the G20 on a permanent basis is another big, uh, big step in that direction. And all the work that's been done on the crypto regulation, on debt and debt issues and multilater multilateral development banks financing, I mean, all of that are all part of how we know the, the Prime Minister refers to as we need to help the Global South. Do you want to uh, share some light on how you think global indebtedness for those countries that are heavily indebted uh, is being dealt with and what more would you like to see? You know, after a long time, I think we're beginning to see progress on that front. For me, the debt relief and the debt restructuring that was done for Zambia is quite a landmark. Mm -hmm. We had creditors of all different, you know, the Paris Club, non-Paris Club, private creditors all come together to agree on a set of re on restructuring for Zambia, I think that's a big deal. India, along with uh, the IMF and the World Bank, were part of the put put out the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. That has played a very important role, and also in trying to engage and trying to fix problems in the global debt architecture. So I think we've made progress, but a whole lot more is still needed, and we need to do make these restructurings happen at a much faster pace. You know, outside of all global macroeconomic questions, you may have seen that one video of uh, the IMF boss, Kristalina Georgieva. She's doing a sumbly dance number, <laughs> and I'm wondering when you're seeing that video, what's going through your head? And she came, she's been smashing the internet. Yes. Uh, and earlier, you were the one IMF uh, nominee that most people know. She's not there yet, but she's getting <laughs> a couple of more dance moves, and then she's going to smash the internet some more. Now this, that's typically Kristalina. That is her. She loves to dance. So, uh, you know, you, other, when she sees other people dancing and she sees good music, hears good music, uh, she wants to she get in. She was the only one who got into the groove, okay? She was like totally having fun and joining in. Most of the others saw Dur Dur Se, but she, she went in and yeah. you know, really was part of the cultural emotion. Absolutely. No, that's her. That's just total her. You're not doing that. <laughs> You know, there's been talk of millets uh, and pushing millets linked to climate security, linked to using less, um, uh, you know, using less water. But then there's also just overdose of millets, right? Uh, you were at the state bank. Where? How was it? You l you loved your millets or not so much? Yeah, there was a lot of millets. It was it was very it was very good. It was delicious. You're being diplomatic. <laughs> No, I enjoyed it. it. But yes, there were a lot of millets in the, <laughs> yeah. in the menu. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic having you with us and we wish you all the best and I hope you uh, eat some millets and get to eat some non-millets as well. Thank Thanks, you very Sarah. much for your time. Thanks, Keith. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.